All right, so this is uh, information on the chemistry of life. Uh, ask Mr. Tolls to please fast forward to where your particular class left off. Take notes in Cornell notes. Uh, and uh, let's be clear, some of these questions, some of this content will be on the exam on uh, next week. So let's go through this. Again, fast forward where you need to where you need to. If you don't watch this in class, uh, you'll have it at home. Uh, I'll, I will post it this evening with the message that you shouldn't watch it until after class. Mr. Tolls may not be able to get it uh, to work with his login. So uh, sometimes YouTube isn't allowed unless you have the full teacher access. All right, so the chemistry of life is, there, is uh, organic chemistry, and it is focused on this one element type called carbon. Now, that's going to be an important element, uh, as you'll see throughout the course. Uh, carbon has six protons and has mass of 12. And we'll discuss how to calculate uh, atomic mass and, and to discover the neutron number in just a little bit. All right. So an element is a substance that can't be broken down into simpler chemical substances. So what's that mean? Well... I don't like that they use plutonium, but we should point out that plutonium is radioactive. It is an example of an element, and oxygen is an example of another element. And there's many different elements on the periodic table, which is a summary of all the known elements uh, in the world, in the universe. And so when we take a look at something like like water, which is H2O, it looks like this. This is what it looks like. And you've all, I, said, I like water because most kids have heard of H2O. And that's two particular elements, the element oxygen, the element hydrogen. And there's two hydrogens. That's what this little two, uh, at this little subscript two means. So it's H2O means that you have um, two hydrogens and one oxygen. This is what that looks like. The the two hydrogens are each bonded to the oxygen, and we'll talk about what bonding is. But we could take this oxygen, this water, and we can break it up into two different elements. Can you guess what those two elements are? That's right. It would be oxygen and hydrogen. Now, there are two hydrogens there, but the two elements that water can be broken down to is oxygen and hydrogen. You cannot break oxygen down any further. Although this was water, it was a compound, it's a molecular compound, it can, water can be broken down into two elements, one being, of course, oxygen and the other hy uh, hydrogen. So those are the two elements. As we said, there's two hydrogens and there's two, and there's only one oxygen, but the point is that there's an element called hydrogen and and an element called oxygen, and that's what makes water up. So you can take water and break it down into these two elements, where oxygen and hydrogen are those elements because you can't break them down any further. So life on Earth is composed of many different elements, but one common group of, comp of elements that composed every living cell on the planet, and I don't care if it's a tree, or if it's uh, if it's a tree, or if it's uh, a human or bacteria, are these elements here? That's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Phosphorus. Uh, Now, phosphorus here is misspelled. This should be another H there. So phosphorus and sulfur, each of these is a different element that, comp that each individual element cannot be broken down any further, and each element has its own qualities. So carbon has atomic number 6 and a mass number of 12, rounding. Here's the hydrogen with atomic number of 1 and a mass number of 1, again, rounding. And oxygen, each of these are different elements that make up this schnapps, if you will. So each of these elements make up the main components of a living system or a living cell. You need to know what these are for the exam. So I'm letting you know that this is extremely important. Uh, I will put it on the exam.
Okay, moving on. So an atom is made up of different components. A nucleus of an atom is made up of both positive and negative, uh, or rather positive and neutral charges. And so you have a positive charge for an, a proton and a neutral charge for a neutron. And that's what's in the nucleus. Now, again, I don't like this word nucleus because some kids get confused when you use nucleus here in, uh, in chemistry or in, bi in the beginning of uh, the chemistry of life. And then when we look at a cell, we're going to have an organelle that's called the nucleus and nucleolus and has all kinds of different organelles in it. And these, uh, and these little organelles and membranes where this one here is also called the nucleus. Don't confuse the two, okay? One's the nucleus of a cell, the other's the nucleus of an atom. The nucleus of an atom has both protons and neutrons. There they are, protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge, neutrons a zero charge. So try to remember that. People confuse this all the time. I've seen kids put electron when they meant to put pro, uh, protons, and the kids knew better. But when they get on the test, for some reason, they, always, they, they tend to confuse the two. There's no need to confuse them if you keep them straight. Put them on your index cards or when you recite them in class to each other or during advisory. Make sure you know the difference between proton, neutron, and electron. It's also on your practice sheets today. So atomic number is equal to the number of protons, and that's also equal to the electrons when... When the atom is neutral, that means no charge. So protons have a protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. All right, an atomic number is the num is the number of protons that. Literally, that's what that means. So when you hear atomic number, it's just simply the, the number of protons. So that's why these two are equal. These two are always true. These two are always true. Proton number, atomic number are the same thing. Where this one is true only, or rather, I shouldn't have drawn it that way. These two are true only when the atom is neutral. And why does that make sense? Because if you have an atom and it has this bunch of electrons going around it. And there's this has six protons. How do you get a neutral atom? That means it has zero charge. If it didn't have any electrons, if they just had protons and neutrons, neutrons are neutral, so we don't have to worry about those. They have no charge. If this has six pluses, how many negatives do you need to get zero? Well, hopefully you said 6. So 6 minus 6 is 0, and that's how, that is why this is true only when the protons equals the electron number only when the atom is neutral. All right. Okay, so what's key here is that the atomic mass, and I'm just going to put, I'm going to go ahead and put uh, mass number, atomic mass, is equal to protons, uh, let me not put a plus. Protons plus neutrons. All right. So if I give you the mass number and I tell you it's 12, and I tell you the proton number, I tell you it's carbon, so it's uh, you can look it up on the, uh, on the periodic table, but it's 6 plus 6. Of course, this is the mass number is rounding off. How many neutrons do I have? Well, this is just simple, uh, a simple application of algebra. So how do I get the neutron number by itself? I subtract 6 from both sides. And that equals uh, 6 equals the number of neutrons. So the number of neutrons is equal to number six. That is, 
that is the uh, the simplest form of the problem. But can you please pay attention to this? If I ask you for the number of neutrons, that was easy. If I ask you for the proton number and I give you the number of neutrons and the, and the mass number, you should be able to find that. If I, ask, if I give you the number of protons and neutrons, you should be able to find the mass number. So really, the formula is pretty straightforward. There shouldn't be any issues. And by the way, this is what kind of the example that they have here in the, in the slideshow. So um, you should be able to calculate the mass number, the proton number, or the neutron number pretty easily. That should be a gimme question if you remember the mass equals protons plus neutrons. All right, so isotopes are different forms of the same element. So what does that mean? Well, an element is defined by the atomic number. The atomic number defines... The element. So if I tell you it's atomic number six, that equals carbon. If I tell you it's uh, atomic number eight, that equals oxygen. Atomic number one is equal to hydrogen. And atomic number two is equal to helium. And there's just a ton of them, all right? So if you have an atomic number that defines the element, it turns out, and remembering that when you have a, uh, a number of protons, let's say you have carbon has six uh, protons, there they are. But then normally uh, carbon has a mass of 12, so this is carbon this is this is carbon 12. And let me change that. Carbon 12. But then you could also have carbon 14. And that goes back to radio uh, isotope uh, isotopic decay or uh, you know carbon dating. It's called carbon dating. So here we can put neutron, N for neutron. So there's six neutrons, six protons. That's carbon. We're not dealing with electrons right now. Uh, we'll deal with electrons in the next slide. But if you have carbon that has uh, six neutrons and six protons, we call that carbon-12. That's the stable form. That's the most stable form. We find most of, most of the carbon in the universe is carbon-12. But there is this carbon that's a little unstable, which means it decays. It, it's radioactive. And this carbon has one, two, three, four, five, six. Why does it have six? How do I know it has six protons? Because it's carbon. So carbon has to have six protons because the atomic number defines the element. So six protons, so that's how many neutrons then? So that means that if you have six protons still, and you know you have atomic mass of, of 14, remembering that atomic mass... equals protons plus neutrons, I have the number of protons at 6, atomic mass is 14, how many neutrons do I have? That equals 8. So I have 8 neutrons. So protons and neutrons together equal 8. Alright, so when we're dealing with uh, an unstable element, this is unstable, there's less of it, so we call this the isotope. But they're actually isotopes of each other. So they're both they're all they're both carbon. Uh, they're both carbon. One's carbon twelve and one's carbon fourteen. 
They're different forms of the same element, so we call them isotopes. All right, so that's isotopes, and you can see how you can calculate protons and neutrons. Let's move on. Compound. A compound is a substance that is composed of atoms of two or more different elements chemically combined. So here's an example. Three carbons, and we have something here called three carbons, five hydrogens, and two oxygens. So two or more different elements chemically combined. Combined. And another example is H2O. Water is also a compound. Uh, ethanol. Ethanol is, uh, is... And so ethanol actually has this many atoms and this many different elements. Now here's a question for you. How many different elements are in water? Well, I hope you said two elements. One meaning one oxygen, or oxygen is one of the elements, and the other element's hydrogen. Well, how many elements are involved in ethanol? Ethanol is an alcohol. Well, hopefully you say three, and that's equal to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All right. So the number of elements involved in the number of different kinds of atoms is not the same as the number of atoms. If you look here, how many atoms are involved? There's only two elements in water, but there's one, two, three atoms. So there's three atoms and two elements. Here in ethanol, you have only three elements, but you have one plus three is, is four, plus one is five, plus two is seven, plus another one is eight, and the last is nine. So there's actually nine atoms, nine atoms that make up that molecule. There's, only, there's three atoms that make up this molecule, and there's three elements in this molecule, and there's two elements in this molecule. So these are the molecules, the atoms bent, uh, uh, bonded together. Here I'm showing the bonds, and here I'm not. Okay, so that leads us to what are these things that we call bonds. Well, when we're talking about bonds, there are the, the electrons, remember, on the outside are on the outside of the atom. And so if we take a look at uh, oxygen, for instance, oxygen has six uh, or eight protons in the center. There's neutrons, but that's really not important for chemistry. It's important for more for nuclear chemistry, not the kind of chemistry we need to worry about. And it turns out that this oxygen atom, O atom, can make two bonds. It can share two electrons. Usually I would try to explain this to you and go through the whole electron orbitals and try to explain why the atoms share electrons. But I'm going to tell you that for this class, it's not that important. When you get into chemistry, they'll go through and, and, and talk about the different kinds of uh, bonds that atoms can make. But what you can do is you can look at oxygen and then you have hydrogen. And hydrogen can share one electron. And so it could either give away or share an electron. And oxygen can share, not, can share an electron. And when these share electrons, they gather all the electrons they need. So by sharing, they get what they need and they form this thing called a covalent bond. All right, so this is a covalent bond. Water is, is a molecule. It's covalently bonded together. There's another type of, comp of compound that's not really a molecule. It's an ionic compound. And what that means is that there's another thing that atoms do, and that's that they give away or take electrons. So if we take a look at another element called chlorine, a very highly electronegative, or let's just say a very strong atom, likes to pull electrons away. And it comes into contact with this thing called sodium. It's high, a very uh, uh, weak electronegativity, or let's just say it likes to give away electrons. This has an electron to give, and this wants an electron. So really badly, the chlorine is much more powerful when it comes to grabbing electrons. And so what chlorine does is it takes the electron. 
When that happens, sodium now has one more proton than electron. It was neutral before, all right? It had 11 protons, 11 electrons, all right? Sodium is atomic number 11. And now that it lost an electron, it has 11 protons, 11 protons, and only 10 electrons. So electrons are negative and protons are positive. So that leaves you with a plus one charge. I hope that makes sense. So what happens is that sodium has a plus one charge. So it's sodium plus one. Now when we take a look at chlorine. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. So it's 17 protons. And before it took an electron, it had eight, that's 17 pluses. It had 17 electrons before it took one. But then after it took one, you have chlorine with an extra electron. So now you have, uh, oops, I put positive on both of those, didn't I? 17 positives and 17 negatives. And when you look at chlorine, it takes the two electrons. So now it has an extra electron, two extra electrons where sodium lost it. And what's, if, it, if instead it has 17 protons minus 18 electrons. Why does it have 18 now? Because it used to have 17, it took one. So now it has a negative one charge. So chlorine has a negative one charge. Sodium has a positive one. And chlorine has a negative one. Well, what does sodium or what does a positive do to a negative? I hope you say they they attract. So whenever the sodium is near the chlorine, they kind of stick together like magnets. They're not sharing electrons, so it's not as strong a bond as this covalent as this covalent bond up here. Okay, these two aren't really sharing electrons. They're just sticking near each other because they're opposite charges. So sodium chloride, or you know it as table salt, is sodium metal and chlorine, the chlorine and sodium atom, bonding or uh, being attracted to one another because of this ionic nature or the fact that they're charged. These atoms are charged. Their protons and electrons are not equal to each other. All right, so when we're talking about chemical reactions, you have to remember that all living things are made of cells, and cells are, are bags, you know, they're lipid layers, they're three-dimensional, they're not, they're, not, they're not just length and width, they actually have, you know, space, they're more like baggies than they are like a, like a flat piece of paper. And here you have a nucleus, you have an endoplasmic reticulum, they have a rough, you have the smooth, you have a Golgi body, you have uh, ribosomes, you have vesicles, you have kind of a matrix, etc. So you have cells, all right? And these cells, what they do is they, they conduct chemical reactions, okay? And these chemical reactions, they're, they're just going on all the time, everywhere, all kinds of different chemical reactions. And that's what makes up life. That's everything that is life is all about chemical reactions. Now, the interesting thing is that chemical reactions require energy, Again, chemical reactions, and in fact, any action or reaction, right, requires energy. Okay, and the process of how many chemical reactions are positive or negative, building or taking apart, we call that, we call that metabolism. So metabolism, so chemical reactions require energy. And all the chemical reactions together in, uh, in a system, any system, in this case we're talking about, you know, like let's say your human body or, or a cell or an elephant or a kangaroo, what have you, a, all the chemical reactions that occur within that organism, we call it metabolism. So that's the sum of all the reactions. So all the positive and negative reactions, all the, 
I shouldn't say positive and negative because that might confuse you with the ions. So let's just say all the building and all the and all the taking apart. Uh, so there's two things that living things can do. Just like if you think of living things as a as giant Lego builders, you can build something up, right? So you pile up the Legos one on top of the other, uh, clicking them as you go and build something. Or you can have something built already, and what you could do is just start taking them apart. So when you're building them, when you're building them up, you're, we call that anabolism. That's where we get this word, anabolic steroids. Those are steroids that help you build muscle, right? So that's anabolism. By the way, very bad for you. Uh, don't take steroids unless the doctor prescribes them. They have a lot of side effects. So we can, and that, so when a, when a chemical reaction is building, we call it anabolism. So that's building, building up the body, uh, building muscle, etc. So making complex uh, molecules from simple ones like Lego. If you think of a Lego as a simple uh, molecule, but then you put a bunch of these together, you build something. So that's anabolism. Catabolism is when you have a complex molecule already, you have something built, and you're breaking it apart. You're breaking it down. So that's called catabolism. And you do both. You do both of these. All living things do both of these. And those, the sum of these two, the building and the breaking down, the sum is known as metabolism. So when they say you have a fast metabolism, you have a slow metabolism, they're talking about how much in total, because energy is required for both of these, right? How much energy do you have? Uh, how much energy is being burnt up to either break things down or build things up? Um, <clears throat> I say most people don't really have faster or, or slow metabolism. It's just some people move around a lot more and others don't move around as much. All right. So, you know, if, you, if people say you have a fast metabolism, it's probably just that you do a lot. You're always constantly moving. And that's really, uh, you know, breaking down uh, sugars. It's building up muscle. So you end up, uh, you know, uh, staying thin. Where if you don't move around a lot, you're not moving and walking and constantly on the, on the move for whatever reason, then you're not really tearing down or building up much of anything, so your metabolism is, is slower. There are ways to speed up your metabolism by, by diet or exercise. Those are, those are the healthiest ways for you to speed up your metabolism. All right, let's move forward. All right, mixtures. A mixture is a combination of substances. So you can think of a mixture as taking a, a, a jar, some kind of uh, a little pile of pepper in here, right? And then you add to it salt, right? And if you add salt and pepper together and mix it up, what you're going to end up with is uh, some pepper inside the salt, and that's a mixture, right? And you can see the little pepper flakes in the salt. Uh, so that's it. Those are the components are not, they're not really mixing together. They're not, well, they're mixing, but they're not reacting chemically, right? They're just sitting there next to each other. They're they're mixed up, like taking, oh, you know, uh, with the example I always like are those, uh, when I used to take my nephews and nieces to the, uh, <clears throat> um, the ball pits um, where the kids would go jumping in the balls and you have so that's really a mixture when they have all the red and yellow balls and even the kids are in there all mixed in together that's a mixture okay they're physically combined they're no, there's no chemical reactions no sharing of electrons or taking of electrons or giving of electrons they're just mixing them up physically alright a solution is uh, is an example of a mixture, all right? So here we talked about a salt and, a salt and pepper. Um, 
And that's when you distribute even evenly. It's solve a solution is when you perfect you've you've uh, evenly distributed all the solutes or all the components. The components of a mixture. That means the parts of a mixture are the solute, right? And the solvent. The solvent is the thing that is doing the mixing. is is the is usually more. There's more of the solvent than there is the solute. Uh, it's usually the the solute is distributed within the sol uh, the solute is distributed within the solvent. So if you look here at the salt and pepper evenly, let's say it's evenly distributed. Let's assume it's evenly distributed very well. Evenly just a solid solution. So here you have this this evenly distributed material, pepper and salt. Doesn't have to be perfect, but what have you. Because which one is there more of, salt or pepper? Well, I hope you said salt. And so you can see, I would say that the salt the pepper is dissolved in the salt. So then therefore the pepper is the solute and the salt is the solvent. So this is going to take some work for you to really make sure that these words that sound very similar are separated in your mind clearly. So the solute is distributed evenly within the solvent. So the solvent is the thing that does the dissolving the solute is the thing that's being dissolved. All right. Doing the dissolving and being dissolved. Now, that being said, let me be very clear. This is another one of those points where people confuse, uh, get confused all the time. Dissolving, when something's dissolved, uh, in other words, it goes into solution, it becomes a solution. The solvent dissolves the solute. This is all physical. There's no chemical reaction in it. It may look like it's chemical because something seems to be going away or changing, but it doesn't really change. All right. And a suspension is a mixture of non-dissolved materials in water. So that means it's not, they're not dissolved. You can see them. You can see the different components uh, clearly. So what do I mean by things seem to go away? That something is dissolved, right? Uh, let's, and why do I say it's not a chemical reaction? Why do I say it's not actually gone away? So let's take, let's take a look at, this just for a moment. Let me add sugar to water. Anybody that's made Kool-Aid knows that it tastes wonderful. Sugar water is great. Let's say it's red Kool-Aid. So you have this, this uh, red Kool-Aid uh, material. And the red, the red Kool-Aid material, uh, is, you put sugar into it, so it's water. What happens, let's say you didn't have any red. Let's forget about the red, and let's think about, let's think about a system that has, instead of the red, let's think about a system that's just, it's just clear. It's just water, it's plain water. And you're adding sugar to it. What, sugar is solid, it's white, right? Since you even you could even add cubes of sugar, so you have all these little cubes of sugar you're adding to there, and it's made of glucose and it's sweet. And what happens when you add it to water? It seems to it well it does disappear. You don't see it anymore. Well, all you see is clear water. It looks like it's water. If you taste it, you can taste the sugar though, can't you? You can taste the sugars. Is there a way that you can think of 
that we could take this beaker of sugar water and take the water out and leave the sugar behind. If, and there's an if-then statement here, this could be an experiment if you wanted it to be, uh, if you have a, a beaker of sugar water, is there a way to take away the water and leave the sugar? Well, the answer is yes, there, there is. If you heat, if you heat up the beaker to about 100 degrees Celsius, what you're going to get is an evaporation or the water is going to start to, to leave. And that's called boiling or evaporation. So the water is going to evaporate. And eventually, if you want to boil it, you heat it up enough, 100 degrees, you'll get it to boil at room temperature, of course. I mean, at, room, at one atmosphere pressure. So you, the water evaporates and goes away at 100 degrees Celsius. It boils at, at one atmosphere pressure. So the water's going. It's called steam, right? This, this water turning to gas is called steam. That's a gas form of H2O. It's still H2O. It's H2O here, and it's H2O as a liquid. And if it were a giant ice cube it would still be H2O. And that's why these are different phases. And when you change phase from solid to liquid to gas, it's all, it's all water. It's solid water, liquid water, gas water. So that's why we say that changing phases is also a physical change. It's not a chemical change. So if we get rid of all the water, what's going to be left uh, after some time? What do you think is going to be left in that beaker? What you're going to get is that sugar back again. Now, it won't, it won't be in cubes, but I'm just drawing it in cubes so you see it is sugar. You can think about it as sugar. So these cubes of sugar are now in the beaker rather than the water. The water's gone. So we put the sugar in. It won't be in cubes. It'll be more of a powder and it'll be stuck to the side of the glass. But we put the sugar in and it seems to disappear. It seems it's gone. Something's changed, you say. Well, the thing is that if you, if you went ahead and did an experiment and heated it up and got rid of the water, what you would end up with is almost exactly, and only due to experimental error would there be a difference, almost exactly the same amount of sugar that you started with. So if you had two grams of sugar, you put it, if you put two grams in, what you get out is two grams of sugar. So what did that prove? What was all that about? Well, that proved, I think, or at least it should really give you a good indication that there's there's a lot of support for the acceptance of the idea that sugar that that uh, changing phase number one and number two that dissolving is a physical change not a chemical change how do I know that because when we dissolved it it did not it did not go away it didn't change the material really didn't change. It just disappeared. It got separated very finely in this uh, very fine separation in the system. So when we added the sugar to the water, it got broken up so such tiny little parts. It got separated from each other. The little sugar molecules got separated from each other, and they disappeared. So we call that dissolving. So, okay, pH is a measure of acidity. So we say, and this isn't, it's a really, really weird thing to say, but the stronger the acid, the lower the pH. People don't, a lot of kids don't, uh, I shouldn't say kids, a lot of people don't understand that. And that's, it has a lot to do with math, and I can tell you it's a negative log of the ion concentration. And I could discuss it and show you mathematically how you, get, how you derive it, but it's not really important for this class. <clears throat> What is important is you understand that it's a scale. It goes from zero, all right? Uh, it goes from zero to one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Seven is neutral. 
At 7, it's not acid or base. It's not one or the other. This side is acid. That's 0 to, to about to 7 is acid. And then from 7 to 14 is base. So when we say an acid or a base, we're talking about the pH level. Now, what exactly is pH level? We'll have to talk about that later, but... Just so you know, there's these things called hydrogen ions. Now, we talked about hydrogen, and someone in one of the classes asked, well, if hydrogen has an atomic number of 1, it has a mass number of 1 rounded off, then does that mean that it doesn't have any neutrons? And the answer is yes, that's right. Hydrogen ions are basically a proton. A single proton with a, sing, uh, the, a hydrogen a hydrogen atom, that means a neutral atom, is one single proton and one electron. That's the simplest atom there is. There it is. There's hydrogen. Now, if we went ahead and took the electron away, that would make this hydrogen ion. And, of course, it would be plus one charge because we got rid of an electron. So if we do that, we end up with H+. Plus, an H plus, or hydrogen with, that's a proton with no electron, is simply a proton, right? H plus ion is just a proton. So pH is a measurement, if you have a beaker, again, another system, and you have a, some kind of liquid form, some solvent, solute, you could have some uh, solvent, or the, sol the solvent might be water. The solute will be hydrogen ions. These hydrogen ions are single protons, are floating around here. The, lar the more of these hydrogen ions you have floating around here, the lower the pH. It's a reverse relationship. So the more, so this is the hydrogen ion concentration, and the square brackets mean concentration. So the more, the larger the number, the pH value, the less of these hydrogens you have. The lower the pH, the lower the pH number, more hydrogen ions. The higher the pH number, less hydrogen ions. Both acids and bases are both reactive. They can be, both be caustic. So, you know, uh, lye, for instance, has a pH of about 14. Uh, you know sodium hydroxide as uh, as bleach. You know sodium hydroxide, very 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 basic stuff. And what you'll see is it's around ten or twelve or fourteen, depending on the concentration. Where an acid, an acid is the opposite, and it turns out that an acid can have uh, go you know anywhere from seven to you know to one to uh, even, uh, any one of these is, which means all this means is that there's more hydrogen ions in the solution. I know it's crazy that the lower the number, the more hydrogen ions, but that has to do with some math that, uh, I could show you, but we really just don't have time to, to discuss that it goes back to that pH or the negative log of, of something. So pH is uh, below 7 is acidic, above 7 is basic. So that's something that you really just need to make sure you got in your head. Below 7 is acidic and above 7 is basic. So if I tell you a solution has uh, an acidity of th pH of 3, then you know it's an acid. If I tell you something has a pH of 9, then you know it's a base. All right, let's move on. Well, here's some examples of that, right? So zero, pH zero, battery acid is around there. Stomach acid is around two. Apple juice is about three. We have these indicators that change color called pH hydrion, hydrion, hydrion uh, paper. Uh, we have uh, litmus paper, several different kinds of, of indicators that change color depending on the pH. And neutral is, of course, seven. And so when you look at pure water, it's exactly 7, right? Coffee is, is a little acidic. It's 5. Apple juice is 3. Um, household ammonia is at 12. And drain cleaner, Drano, is 14. So drain cleaner is pretty much lye. 
and battery acids pretty much uh, it's not quite zero but it's pretty much uh, an, uh, the strongest acid so you go from battery acid to, to drain cleaner and everything in between uh, almost every substance that that is an acid or base we can separate it uh, all of the substances are acid and bases fall within this range so the acid is anything less than 7 a pH of 7 and 7 is neutral and then anything more uh, pH is um, larger greater than 7 it's uh, it's base so when we look at water water is so important because outside uh, remember that whole schnapps well, water is part of schnapps, isn't it? Uh, if we take a look at water, H2O, that's two hydrogens connected to an oxygen. Water, and this is schnapps, C-H-N-O-P-S. And in case you forgot, it's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Water, it has oxygen and it has hydrogen. So it's two of the elements of schnapps. And that makes sense because water ends up making anywhere from 70 to 95% of organisms on the planet Earth. So you're made up of about 70 plus percent of, of you is water. You are a solution. There's, your cells have solutions in them. They have varying, varying concentrations of solute or varying amounts of solute in the solution. So uh, when we talk about schnapps, when we talk about this water molecule making up most of organisms found in on the planet it's not it's not uh surprising that the atoms that or elements that make up water are in schnapps right because water is uh is a 70 to 95 percent of most living things and these are the elements the main elements in life so it's not that wouldn't be surprising at all. Now this is going to be very important for you to understand, um, and it's going to be important for you to understand because when we start talking about these atoms and these and these molecules, when we start talking about these things called biomolecules or very large molecules, you're going to have to uh, consider that these these molecules are not. Uh, bonded together evenly always. Sometimes the at a strong atom is bonded with a weaker atom. So let's take a look at at water, for instance, and we're going to use water a lot this year as far as the discussion point because it's so important to life. But water actually has a partial negative charge. This is a the Greek delta lowercase delta called uh, you know it looks like a little s, but it has a little loop on it. That's a Greek letter delta, right? And that means partial. That equals a partial charge. We looked at... We looked at... Uh, let's give me a second. We looked at... Ions. And ions, one got taken, the other given, and one became positive, the other negative. Well... There are these things that happen with partial charges. So this ends up being partially negative. This is partially positive. This side's partially positive. So between these bonds here, this side, this is partially negative. This is partially positive. How is it possible to have a partial charge? Well, these atoms, these three atoms, oxygen, these three atoms, but two elements, right? Oxygen. Now, this is something I'll, I'll go ahead and state it. I try to hint at it throughout the video, but let me state it clearly. I will ask you a question. I'll show you a molecule and ask you how many elements are, there, are in this molecule, and then I'll ask you another question, how many atoms are in this molecule. Hopefully, you can tell me with water, for instance, there are three atoms and two elements. If you don't understand that, it's something to really discuss with your group in, in a, in your, in activ during the activity or during your study group session. Uh, and know the how know how to figure out how many elements versus how many atoms. Okay, so here we have uh, three uh, three atoms, uh, two elements. It's water, and I said that they're partial charges that they're bonded covalently, so they are sharing, but they're partially charged, which means there's more electrons around the oxygen most of the time versus 
around the ad around the hydrogens, and because of that, the hydrogens become partially charged, a positive charge. Means is that when you're looking at these atoms sharing, oxygen is so much stronger that it keeps the electrons around it more often. So you have to think about these the sharing where sharing covalently uh, is generally even if it's evenly shared we call it nonpolar. So it's like two people that share uh, 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 a car, and each one of them gets it for uh, you know uh, twelve hours a day. Then they're evenly sharing the car. But if two people are sharing the car and one is older or bigger and takes the car, you know, uh, 18 hours out of the day and only gives the car to the other, ki uh, the other person while he's sleeping for a couple hours, that's unevenly shared. Well, sometimes what you get, for instance, and in the example of water, is you get this uh, oxygen atom that is able to uh, take the electrons from hydrogen and keep them most of the time. So for whatever reason, water is, the, the water molecule is able to take the electrons, keep them most of the time, and so oxygen becomes negatively charged and hydrogen becomes partially positively charged. So oxygen is partial negative and hydrogen is partially positive. So that being said, when you're when you're dealing with an atom like this, any atom that has this kind of structure, you're going to get these li really really weak forces that attract it. Where you had sodium was a plus 1 and chlorine was a negative 1, they have a fairly uh, a stronger attraction to each other than something like oxygen. Now, this is a covalent bond, so that naturally it's a stronger bond, but what ends up happening is if you look at now an attraction between two water molecules, and you see that this has a partial negative charge and this has a partial positive charge. So this has a partial positive charge. This has a partial positive charge. So it's a partial negative charge. It has a partial positive charge. What happens is that that this uh, that these atoms, these molecules, in the, the uh, start to arrange each other. So this negative starts to attract the positive, and this negative starts to attract uh, the other positive, and the molecules turn. They turn in such a way as to line up, and what you get is this lining up of water. And it lines up over and over again. And that why is it lining up this way? Because there's this attraction between the partial negative charge of oxygen and the partial positive charge of hydrogen. And so it's partial. It's not an ionic bond. They're still covalently bonded. But because there's a negative side and a positive side, there is a negative and a positive side. We call these polar. So polar literally means that the charges are not even. There's two sides. So like a north pole or south pole, like the positive and negative pole of a magnet. Uh, so whenever something's polarized, there's two sides. So here we have this uh these poles this is each each hydrogen is partially positively charged each negative is partial is partially each oxygen is partially negatively charged and so what you end up getting is this alignment where the opposites attract and the like charges repel and that's called this bond here is called the hydrogen bonding so it's not really a bond. These are not sharing electrons. Uh, and it's not an ionic bond, but it's a very weak intermolecular bond that attracts one molecule to the other. Notice that these are molecules. This is a molecule of water, this is a molecule of water, and this is a molecule of water. But it's the, it's the partial charges that attract each other that line everything up.
And so this is a, a, a pulling between molecules, where this is the pulling between atoms. This is much, much stronger. This is much, much weaker. So it's because water is polar that water has these, these really, really interesting properties. And so one of the things that people don't think about is water is really sticky. It sticks to itself. It sticks to you. Think about it. When you're showering and you might think, well, I feel clean after a shower, only because you use something to take the water off of you. And that's called a towel, right? So water molecules are sticky. And it's really mind-blowing when you think about it. When you get in the shower and the water's running on, uh, on, your, on your skin, it feels clean. But when you're done, turn the, when you turn the water off, what is your body? It has no clothes, so there's nothing wicking it up. But what's, key, what's on your body still? Water. Well, how's the water staying on your skin? It, it's staying on your skin because water's sticky. And it's sticky because it's polar, right? Now, I'm not talking it's sugar sticky, but it is sticky. And because water is polar, it has adhesive uh, uh, properties. So it sticks to, to you like glue, uh, very, very weak glue, but it does. It has cohesive properties, which means they stick to each other. So if you think about it, if you ever did this experiment, you could, I think it's safe to do it at home, but you should check with your parents. If you have this penny, if you're looking at a, the, at a penny well, by the side, you know, it has little ridges, and you took water, and you started putting one drop of water. Let me redraw that one drop of water onto the penny at a time, what you're going to get is you're going to get this mound of water. And you can look at it from the side. And this is water. You can see it's clear. It sits on. And it, But here's a question for you. How is it that these, this is made of molecules, right? This, this water droplet's made of molecules. And uh, the water droplet's made of molecules. So is the, so is the water on the penny. So now the question is, why, why does the water molecule stick to it? Why is it that uh, hold on a second. So the water droplets are going out of this, this uh, penny, and the question is, why is it that the water just doesn't run off? Why does it stick up make and uh, stick? And why is it stick? What is it sticking to? And what is it doing when it's making this mound? Well, it doesn't run off. It's because the water molecules all are they're all sticking to one another. And because water's sticky, it sticks not just to other things, but it sticks to itself. What you see is you see water just sticking to itself, and all these billions of water molecule molecules all one next to the other sticking to one another. And that's that particular property, that stickiness of water, that when it sticks to itself, is called cohesion, right? It's, it's this cohesive effect, where water, when it's sticking to other things, we call it adhesive. So adhesive is when it sticks to other things, and cohesive is when it sticks to itself. Co, right, together, to, right? All right, so water is able to absorb large amounts of heat. As a result, lakes, oceans uh, stabilize the air and land temperatures. So just know that, that water is able to suck up a lot of heat, right? That's the second point you have to remember. And water absorbs heat when it evaporates, allowing organisms to, 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 to sweat, uh, to relieve themselves of heat. So if you, have a, if you have your skin of your arm and you start to pull these little beads of, of sweat on your arm... And we could talk about phase change, phase change energy, but we won't because we don't have time. But what happens is the water evaporates. And when the water on your skin evaporates, and that's what we call sweat, right? Sweat has, it's mainly water, although there's, there's urea in there and there's salt and all kinds of other things. Anybody that's actually done a lot of exercising for, for a period of time, you've probably felt the salt crystals on your skin. That's because the water evaporates and the salt stays behind. Well, in order for water to go from the liquid phase, this is the liquid, right? And remember, we said it was a, a physical change, right? 
to the gas form, we call this uh, water vapor, right? And this is liquid water, and it's a solution, but liquid water solution because there's things dissolved in it, urea and salt, etc. So liquid water, and I don't know why I put liquid there twice, but. So we have uh, liquid water is uh, is on your skin, and as it evaporates, it requires heat. So heat goes, the heat from your body goes into this water, and when it does that, the water evaporates and takes with it into the air your heat. So all the heat moves with the water vapor, with the water when it goes from liquid to gas. That's what we call, that's why we, that's how your skin cools you off when you're sweating. That's why you sweat, to cool off. Because water expands and it freezes, ice floats. And that prevents leaks, uh, lakes and oceans from freezing solid. Now let's think about what that means. So if you have, Amy. So if you have this bowl, and let's think of the bowl as a lake, and here's a hill, there's grass, and it's maybe a tree. All right. And on this side is, is some more grass and some more, some more trees. There's a little fish in here. A lot of fish and turtles and frogs and whatever. When, when, when winter comes, what happens is that the surface of... You ever wonder how... By the way, have you ever wondered why, how is it that fish survive the, the winter? In ponds especially, but lakes. Well, what happens is the water on top freezes. And because ice is less dense than then water, our solid water is less dense than, than uh, liquid water, the solid water freezes and stays on top. So the staying on top, the floating, happens because water is uh, less dense when it's solid. That's not the case for most materials. Most materials that things are solid are more dense. And the liquid form is less dense. Well, not water. Water is reversed. And because of that, this ice sheet, right, sits on the surface. And below that ice sheet, <coughs> it's still liquid water. So the fish, the turtles, etc., can survive. The turtles and amphibians, they, the reptiles and amphibians usually bury themselves under the the. Uh, bury themselves into this uh, mud and muck underneath the inside the water, deep into the deeper into the pond soil itself at the bottom of the pond. But what have you? <clears throat> the point is that this ice sheath, this ice shelf, what it does is it it protects the liquid water underneath from freezing. If this was not true, if ice did not float, if ice was as, like most things, most other things, if the solid form of water was more dense than the liquid form of water, then what would have happened is that that ice wouldn't float, it would sink to the bottom and things would freeze from the bottom up and that would just kill everything. So there would be impossible for uh, life to exist on Earth. So water's very property of, or ice floating is actually uh, one of the reasons life exists on this planet. Uh, then it says water is able to dissolve many substances so that water inside and water and outside the cell is able to carry nutrients uh, in and around the cells and waste away from the cells. So we call this property of water, we call water a universal solvent. So 
it's not really universal, but let's just say it has the ability to dissolve so many different things, whether they were uh, uh, polar or nonpolar. This universal solvent called water is really a good solvent. It really dissolves just about anything. Now, you know that because when it's time to clean, most of us go for a bucket of water. When you go wash your hands, you wash it in water. You don't wash it in oil or you don't wash it in Coca-Cola. You wash it in water. Why? Because water is a universal solvent. We know that intuitively. So it'll dissolve all the, all the muck on our hands, especially if we had a little soap when we have grease on it. It's, it's still a very, uh, very much a universal solvent. All right, well, that's it. I, I think that's way more than enough. It's only 17 slides, uh, but I'll finish the rest of it on on uh, on Thursday and uh, and give you some more practice problems. And then remember Wednesday is... Uh, I'm sorry, I'll give you more. Uh, we'll finish the rest of this on Wednesday, and then the following Wednesday is your test. So that should give you enough to study for a couple days. All right. See you on uh, see you on Wednesday.